Hi guys, it's Dylan from Bijou Diamond Jewelry in London with another watch video. And today we're comparing the Nautilus with the Aquanaut. So as with all my reviews, let's go back in time and take a look at the history of these two watches. I'm not gonna look as in depth as I usually do. Um, if you wanna learn really in depth about the history of the Nautilus, then please go check out my 5711 review. Um, I've also done an Aquanaut review as well, uh, so go check that out as well. Uh, that will definitely look much more in detail at the history of these pieces. I will go over the very basic history though in this video anyway. So we're going to skip back in time now to the late 1960s, uh, specifically 1969, which is when uh, Seiko released the Quartz Movement. The Quartz Movement was released around a time, or the 60s really was a time where uh, we were really interested in futuristic technology, space travel, um, moving forward with technology in society. And, and the Quartz Movement was so fitting for uh, that kind of time, you know, looking at futuristic technologies. And everyone absolutely loved it as a result of that. It was incredibly re reliable, incredibly accurate. Um, it was much cheaper as well and could go on for a long, long time. You didn't need to wind it at all as well. Um, you know, the batteries lasted a long time. And so everyone absolutely loved the quartz movement. And as a result of this, the Swiss watch industry with mechanical movements, old fashioned mechanical movements, uh, really suffered majorly and they lost a huge number of sales as a result. Um, so all the brands knew they had to really do something special to bring back the interest in the Swiss watch industry and mechanical movements. And Audemars Piguet really was the leader in kind of finding this new way to bring back the interest in the industry. And that was with the release of the Royal Oak, which was a steel sports watch finished to an unbelievable level. Really, it was actually finished to a higher level than a dress watch. Um, the watch was also 10 times the price of kind of the equivalent sports watch from Rolex, i.e. the Submariner. Uh, so it was incredibly expensive, but that was because it was so difficult to machine uh, out of steel and to machine it to that level, uh, with that level of detail and craftsmanship. So it was an incredibly expensive watch, but people actually realized after a little while why it was so special and why it was actually worth that money, and ultimately why it was still worth buying a Swiss watch. And Patek Philippe, a few years later on in 1976, released the Nautilus, uh, which was a similar watch to the Royal Oak, uh, designed by the same guy, Gerald Genta, and it was similar in the fact that it was a steel sports watch finished to an exceptional level. Um, in fact, it was even more expensive than the Royal Oak. It was one of the most expensive watches you could buy at that time, in fact. Again, people really understood how special that watch was, um, and it definitely gained in popularity after a little while. Those two watches and some other watches in the industry really brought back interest into the Swiss watch industry and really helped out Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet in boosting sales again. Um, skipping a few years on to the 90s though, uh, kind of around the 90s or, or previous to the 90s, uh, most people that bought really high-end Swiss watches were kind of older people or you know people further on in their life, not necessarily young people. In the 90s though, um, there was definitely more interest in Swiss watches from a younger audience uh, in their 20s and 30s. And so Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet both really wanted to create a watch that would satisfy that audience. So in the early 90s, in fact, um, Audemars Piguet released the Royal Oak Offshore, which was a watch designed by a young watchmaker or young watch designer, um, and it was designed for a very young audience. It was just a much chunkier, uh, more action oriented watch or sports oriented watch versus the Royal Oak. And in 1997, Patek Philippe followed suit and they designed something also for a younger audience. Their kind of goal was designed. Uh, reshape the Nautilus into something for a younger person, but also something that was much more affordable than the Nautilus. And so they released in 1997 the Aquanaut, and that was the reference 5060, um, which was a 35 millimeter case size, featured a rubber strap for the first time ever for Patek Philippe. They'd never created a watch previous to the Aquanaut that featured a rubber strap. The watch was a simple time and date only watch. Um, it was a steel case finished to the same you know, standard as the Nautilus, so a very, very high level of finishing. And then shortly after that, Patek Philippe released the 5065, which was a the, nicknamed the Jumbo, which is a 38 millimeter version. That was kind of the iconic Aquanaut and, and what made it much more famous than the first reference. And then later in 2007, to mark the 10 year anniversary of the Aquanaut, Patek Philippe released the 5167, which is the reference that we're looking at today, which features a 40 millimeter case size. And skipping one year back from there, 
and moving back to the Nautilus again uh, in 2006, Patek Philippe revamped the whole Nautilus line and one of those watches they revamped was the, uh, the standard uh, Nautilus just with the time and date um, and that was the 5711 and that was probably, in fact still is one of the most important watches Patek has ever released and, and remains to be one of their most popular models in their whole entire collection. So that's the basic history of these two models. Let's take a look now at the features of these watches. So we're gonna start as always with the clasps on these watches. Uh, we're gonna take a look firstly at the Nautilus. The Nautilus clasp is not my favorite clasp. It features this kind of flimsy fold over section, uh, which I really am not a fan of. It doesn't feel as expensive and luxurious and uh, you know fine level craftsmanship that the rest of the watch feels like. Uh, feels like an afterthought. In fact, the whole clasp on this watch really feels like an afterthought. Uh, the actual clasp mechanism itself is a friction clasp, so um, you have to really pull it hard in order to open up the watch. It's definitely not as secure as something like a twin trigger clasp where you really know when, you know, when you press those two triggers in, you know when that clasp is releasing. Whereas this um, pressure clasp or, or when you pull the clasp on the 5711, it's pretty difficult to know when it's gonna start pinging off or uh, you know, you really have to be careful when you're taking this watch off. I think, like I said, a major afterthought in, in terms of how I feel, it definitely feels like Patek didn't put as much attention into this clasp as they did the rest of the watch. Um, it's okay, it's quite comfortable, it's very low profile. Uh, it's definitely not the best one in the industry. The one on the Royal Oak is far better than this watch. Moving now on to our Aquanaut clasp, the Aquanaut clasp is far, far, far better than the 5711 clasp. Uh, this features a twin trigger deployment clasp, but it's actually one of the most mechanically beautiful clasps I've ever seen on watches, in fact. Um, the, just starting on the outside of the clasp, it's very, very low profile. It hugs very close to the actual rubber strap itself. You can see on this side shot, it's very, very low profile. It doesn't protrude much at all from the rubber strap which is brilliant for making sure it's not too much of a scratch magnet. The clasp is also very small as well, which is brilliant, also adding to that, uh, or helping it not be too much of a scratch magnet, and it features our really nice Calatrava cross. Um, twin trigger, like I said, but once we open this clasp up and look inside, you can see how beautiful the mechanics of this is. It's extremely simple, but just so beautiful. All polished finish, and it relies on the flexibility of the metal to release the actual clasp and open up the, the bracelet on this piece. Moving now on to our bracelets or straps on these watches, starting with the Nautilus. We feature obviously a very, very beautiful uh, bracelet on this watch with mostly a brushed finish, uh, but we have these bubble links that are in a polished finish, which are really, really beautiful accent. And obviously the same bubble link connects the case to the bracelet as well. Um, the watch also, or the bracelet also features beveled edges. It just feels very, very refined, very sharp, very clean a really fine piece of Swiss watchmaking and actually jewellery as well. Not quite the same level as the Royal Oak, but definitely a very, very beautiful piece of engineering. Um, the bracelet is also uh, made up of lots of small links, which means it's extremely comfortable because it conforms to kind of any wrist shape really nicely. Moving now onto our Aquanaut uh, strap, we feature a, or it features a very nice vulcanized rubber strap. I'd actually say it's probably one of the highest level of vulcanized rubber straps that I've seen on any watch from any brand. I'd actually say it's probably even a higher level than Richard Mill. Uh, strap features kind of tire effect pattern, which I don't love, but it suits the style of the watch and definitely matches the dial really, really nicely. Um, the strap is very thin as well, which means it conforms to your wrist really nicely. Uh, it's not like uh, an Oyster Flex strap or, or a strap from another brand. Um, the Oyster Flex straps from Rolex are quite chunky and rigid. Uh, they don't conform to your wrist as well as this does. It really hugs your wrist really nicely. Uh, one thing that's not so good that I don't love about the uh, Aquanaut straps is the fact that you have to cut them when you buy them. Something like an Oyster Flex strap from Rolex, you order it in a different size, so it comes in small, medium, etc., etc. et cetera, um, when you buy the watch. So, and also there is a bit of adjustability in, in the clasp which means it can be made bigger or smaller, um, depending if your wrist expands or not. The Audemars Piguet straps, the rubber straps, are um, you able to put the pin in any point on that rubber strap like you would if it was a tang buckle. So you've got adjustability there, whereas the Aquanaut, you cut it and you have to stick with that size. And the clasp has no adjustability in it whatsoever, which means that if your wrist expands, it's gonna become quite an uncomfortable watch. So often we find that our clients that buy this watch actually cut the strap to a much bigger size than they usually would. 
so the watch is actually wearing too big for them. Nonetheless, a really, really cool strap, but that's my only thing. I just wish Patek would release something in the clasp but that would allow it to become a bit more adjustable. Um, moving now onto our cases. The cases may look similar on this watch, but in fact, the bezel is kind of the only thing that is similar. Um, they are totally different cases. Uh, we'll start with the Nautilus. The Nautilus case is an iconic case. It's absolutely beautiful. It's totally fine and, and pure, pure elegance, um, mostly in a brushed finish but features some beautiful little polish accents to kind of highlight the, the edges on this watch. It's very different to the Royal Oak in the fact that the Royal Oak is much more about angular design. This is much more of a flowy watch, um, but features some sharp edges too, just to kind of emphasize that flow. Um, it's actually one of the most balanced and symmetrical watches ever as well, because it features those ears, it kind of hides that crown away. So you lose that asymmetry, you know, asymmetry that you'd usually have with a crown on one side of the watch. Moving now onto our Aquanaut case, we've got an almost all polished finish on this watch. Um, there are certain or brushed accents on this watch, but it's very different to the Nautilus in the fact that it features much more angular designs and sharper, kind of more angular edges that help it to create a much more sporty, kind of younger look. Um, definitely isn't as elegant as the 5711, the Nautilus. Moving now onto the case backs on these watches, uh, both of them feature clear crystal case backs so you can see the movements. Both of the movements on these watches are exceptionally beautiful, um, obviously featuring the Patek Philippe seal. They are finished to the highest level, um, kind of one of the highest levels in the whole industry apart from maybe independent watchmakers. Uh, all the screws are polished, you know, no matter the size of them, they are all finished or everything in the movement is finished to such a high level. Moving now onto the dials on these two watches. Uh, the dials are pretty different on these two. Um, the dial on the 5711 is very simple, very elegant. We've got that ridged effect, which is lovely. And obviously it features a blue dial on this one um, that kind of has this darker effect on the edges. So the extremes of the dial are very dark and it comes to a much lighter color in the center, which helps to bring your attention to the center. I think it kind of almost adds a 3D effect as well, which is lovely. Um, the, the hands and the index markers kind of match. Very, very simple, elegant. It's not as nice, I think, as the, as the, Nord, as the Royal Oak, but very nice, classic, elegant watch nonetheless, or dial nonetheless. Uh, moving now onto our Aquanaut dial. The Aquanaut dial is not one of my favorites. It's definitely bolder, more obvious. It's definitely maybe even more legible, actually. Um, the numbers are not my favorite thing, but it definitely adds to that sporty look and, and works really well with the watch. The hands are slightly more chunky also than the 5711, um, also aiding kind of the more sporty um, you know, feel of this watch. Obviously it's designed to be worn in the water, being an Aquanaut, so it has to be kind of a bit more legible for when you're wearing it underwater. So overall, how do these watches wear and which one do I prefer? Um, they wear kind of different on the wrist. I'd say the, the Aquanaut maybe wears a little bit bigger than the Nautilus. The Nautilus overall though is a much more refined, more elegant watch. It is kind of, it's very difficult to describe. You have to feel them both in, in person to, to really appreciate uh, how the Nautilus feels, but it just feels smaller, more elegant, and a much more, yeah, just much more fine, a fine piece of watchmaking. Whereas the, Nor the Aquanaut is obviously very high level of watchmaking, but just doesn't quite have that same very, very high end feel that the Nautilus has. Uh, I don't think it's just because of the bracelet. I do think, I I'm just judging the case here, obviously, because that's the only thing we can compare. Uh, but yeah, overall, I'd say the Nautilus definitely feels more expensive and more rare, and more high-end. Um, both amazing watches, both serve a fantastic purpose in their own way. We have many clients that own both of these watches and absolutely love wearing both of them. Uh, you know, they wouldn't replace either of them or they couldn't say they could have one over the other. Personally, of the ones, or, or, of these two, which do I prefer? Personally, I prefer the Nautilus. I prefer the slightly smaller case feel that the watch has. I find that it is a bit more of a special piece than the, the Aquanaut. The Aquanaut is great, uh, but the, the Nautilus, you, you feel a bit more special when you wear it. Thanks guys for watching. Let us know in the comments which you prefer. And as always, if you're interested in either of these watches, then don't hesitate to contact us. Our details are in the description and also in the end of the video. Uh, it would be a pleasure to call either of the watches into stock for you.